March 12th, a Tuesday evening. This is reported to be a yellow cab. Dispatch received a 911 call from a resident who, on his way home, spotted a cab. It was parked across the road, blocking his access to the residence. When he approached the cab, he saw the cab driver in a pool of blood. Uh, we identified the cab driver as Philip Swaba. He had numerous stab wounds, including a slash across the throat. He had literally been butchered. Next morning, while we were processing the scene, we found one important piece of evidence, a silver necklace made to look like a bicycle chain. It was located about 30 feet downhill from the cab. Two days later, we'd received a telephone call from Crime Stoppers. A woman had called in stating she knew who owned the necklace. The guy named Larry Upton, a 27-year-old drifter with a very minor criminal history out of Texas. He'd been living in Colorado for the past few months, staying at homeless shelters. My partner, Bob Jaworski, and I then conducted the interrogation. Hi, you're Larry, right? Yeah. OK, Larry, I'm Bob Jaworski. Uh, go ahead and let me get those cuffs off of you real quick, OK? Mm -hmm. You match the description of a couple of guys that uh, are involved in the homicide of the cab driver. What? This is uh, my partner, Bill Burns. Let's go. We'll just go ahead and talk to you. That doesn't matter to me when we start talking. OK. You know where you were a few nights ago? Where about you were at? Say, mm -hmm. Tuesday night? We were drinking on the way up to Barry's. OK, then what happened? We spent the next two hours going over and over Larry's story. I had them call us a cab. I didn't take us up there, and that was it. At that point in the interrogation, we had a surprise for Larry in the next room. Same time we picked him up, we picked up his buddy, Joe Marino, the guy that was with him the night of the murder. And we're talking to Joe, too. All right. And Joe's given us a different series of events. I don't think Joe's talking. There's nothing to talk about. He doesn't, uh, he doesn't believe we've got Joe uh, confessing to everything. Now, you, now you're trying to play games with me. You know, I'm like not playing games either. I think you have some concerns that we're not telling you the truth, Larry. Yep, do. OK. After Joe stabs him twice in the neck, the victim ends up outside the car. You reach down, you grab the victim by the hair, pull his hair back, and you stomp on the back of his head twice and tell him, shut up, bitch, and tell Joe to turn the headlights off because you don't want to draw attention and then you grab him by the hair and cut his throat. Does that sound like we know what we're talking about? We got him in a corner now. He's backed up, defeated. He, he just can't sit still. Is his leg twitching? Some of the best tactics in an interrogation is silence. You put the fact out there, and then you don't say anything. Yeah, it happened. I said I go to jail and I didn't do nothing to him, but get out of the car and run. That's why my lock is there. Then that's what we have to know, okay? Yeah. Tell us what the hell happened. I we can go to the just stick him in the neck and it scared me to death. I ran. Larry told us that when Joe pulled the knife out to rob the cab driver, he freaked out, got out of the cab, and ran away. He said he didn't report the murder to us because he was afraid that Joe was going to kill him. The thing is, but, but you, you were there. there. Happened. Okay. Larry never admitted to stabbing Philip Suave, but he put himself on scene, and that's all we needed to charge him. Hey. Philip Suave was just a hardworking, normal, everyday guy. He had two grown children. He was here in Colorado Springs to earn a living so that he and his wife could retire. They didn't have to kill Mr. Swaba. I think if they would have held a knife on him, he'd have given him his money, and they'd have been on their way. But instead, they chose to brutalize him. I believe Evil got in the cab with Mr. Swaba that night, and he didn't even know.